Good morning. Welcome to today's event organised by the various IP help desks of the European Commission. My name is Simon Cheatham. I'm the team leader with the China IP SME help desk. Um, we are going to take a look at the agenda for this morning. Um, and if we can pull up the uh, agenda slide, uh, you will see that this morning focuses very much on actual experiences of businesses involved in moving to a clean uh, circular economy. Uh, we will have um, an introduction from the EU's executive agency for SMEs, followed by a panel session discussing the uh, IP, the key to success. Uh, and we'll move on to look at the various IP and business challenges faced by European clean tech companies uh, into international markets. Uh, and then take a look at some international case studies in Southeast Asia, Latin America, and a look at the Japan experience. Uh, we will then conclude with a, a round table uh, discussion. So the IP help desks are free services that aim to support the SME and research communities in Europe to make informed and strategic decisions regarding their assets in Europe but also to provide them advice on how to deal with IP when internationalizing to third markets, such as China, India, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Japan. Building on last week at the industry, the EU industry days, this event aims to discuss industrial challenges and highlight opportunities for the Green Deal with regards to intellectual property. It is clear that the EU's ambition is to have an industrial base that is value added, agile, resilient, driven by innovation, and that respects the environment. For the green transition towards a climate neutral EU by 2050 to succeed, it will require EU SMEs to be more competitive and have robust protection against unfair trade practices. In March 2020, the EU launched the EU Industrial Strategy which amongst its key pillars highlights an intellectual property action plan to assess the need to upgrade the legal framework, ensure a smart use of IP and to better fight IP theft. The role of the IP help desks in executing and informing the SME community on how to better protect themselves is evident. Yet nowadays we see that very few SMEs, probably less than 10% protect their intangible assets. And we are strongly convinced that enhanced awareness and protection of IP is incredibly important and an integral part of the twin green and digital transition. So today we will listen to the representatives from the EU, business and service providers on how IP can be used and how it is directly linked to the Green Deal what challenges are, uh, but also listen to a number of success stories and best practices of companies that have successfully leveraged IP to enhance their competitiveness in uh, global markets. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, please note that we encourage participants to ask questions, uh, and this can be done via the chat option in Zoom, and these will be addressed during the round table discussion as long as time permits. If there are time limitations and not all questions can be covered, we will ensure that your question is answered after the event. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Natalia martinez Paramo, Head of Unit Cosme at the EU's Executive Agency for SMEs. Natalia. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes, okay, okay, can you see me? Okay, good, 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 good. So, good morning everyone and welcome to this workshop on the main intellectual property challenges for the AU Green Deal. Let me start 
by expressing my appreciation of the work of the different EU-funded initiative organizing this workshop, the European and International IPR Help Desk, and the AU Japan SME Center. I would like to thank in particular the new member of the group, the India IP Help Desk, which started to operate it in December 2020. Welcome. So before giving uh, way to the panel session, I would like briefly to speak about first the role of EASME in supporting SME's competitiveness. Second, the importance of the international IP SME help desk in the context of European IP policy. And finally, how the European Commission's IP action plan can contribute to the goals of the Green Deal. So let me start by explaining that our mission in EASME is to turn the European policy on SME into action. So we do so by managing on the Commission behalf several EU programs in the field of SME support and innovation, of course, including the IP Help Desk. Europe's 25 million SME represent around 99 of all companies, provide two thirds of all jobs and account for more than half of our GPD. So this is our data impressive one. So our we may say the backbone of the European economy and central to the EU's twin transitions toward greater sustainability and digitalization. We want SMEs to be the driving force behind the recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no question that protecting intellectual property is critical for the competitiveness of SMEs, not at all. So according to 2016 study of the European Union Intellectual Property Office, IP intensive industries account for most of the EU trade with the rest of the world and generate a trade surplus for the EU economy. However, <laughs> we also know that counterfeiting and piracy nowadays continue major, constitutes a major challenge for the most innovative firm. Challenges capable of damaging their economic success and of course also their reputation. So due to the limited resources available and the lack of specialized knowledge of an IP, SMEs are, we have to say, particularly vulnerable to IPR infringement. So is in this context, the European Commission and the Executive Agency for SME decided to create the International IP SME Help Desk, a service, as Simon said, that provides first line free of charge advice on intellectual property issues to all AU SME trading or interested in trading in China, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and as from December in India. So for their contact, with SME and business support organization, the IP Help Desk are very valuable tool in raising awareness on the importance of managing intellectual property assets before expanding to new markets. Let me give you an example. Only in 2020, the International IP Help Desk answered more than 1,600 questions from AU SMEs about IP protection and enforcement. So I want to reiterate our commitment to facilitate access by SMEs to AU funded service, such as the IP Help Desk, and let me insist, is free of charge. So the creation of a single website for several SEMERs of AU IP support to SMEs is really an important milestone that will facilitate such access. So I would like also to encourage the representative of the various initiatives present here today, please to continue working in synergies. So as mentioned in the IP action plan, the EU 
has the means to remain competitive in the global race for technological leadership. So at present, Europe is at the forefront of climate innovation. European companies hold the major portion of green patents and have particularly strong IP portfolio in technologies related to climate change adaptation, carbon capture and storage, water and waste treatment. However, owning world-class technology is not sufficient to ensure the commercial success of the EU clean tech sector. Building the capacity of those companies to manage their IP green portfolio abroad can also contribute to that goal. And the IP help desk do so in events like the one today. So I hope you will find the presentation, the panel discussion and the case studies as they constitute the agenda, that constitute the agenda of this workshop uh, valuable for your future commercials in the areas. So with this, I will conclude my intervention, introduction, and give way to the next session, which will explore key challenges and best practices on managing intellectual property in the clean tech sector. Although I would like to stay with you longer today, I need to excuse myself. So unfortunately, I will have to leave right after my intervention to join another meeting. But anyhow, anyhow you are in a very, very good hands. So thank you very much for your, for your attention and I wish you a really fruitful workshop. Thank you. Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia. Um, we will now move on to the uh, first uh, panel session, um, which takes a look at the as, at IP as the key to success, uh, and uh, looks at some best practice clean tech uh, example um, from the uh, European IP uh, help desk. So, um, if I may, I will hand over uh, now to 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 Jorg. Um, who is co-moderating the, the session, Jörg. Thank you very much, Simon, and good morning to everybody. My name is Jörg Scherer. I'm the coordinator of the European IP Help Test, and a big thank you also to Natalia, who gave her a perfect overview about all, let's say, uh, the existing IP advisory services uh, funded by the European Commission and the IP Action Plan, which will like a guiding principle for the, for the years to come. So it's really my pleasure to welcome our participants to this very interesting session focusing on IP challenges for the Green Deal. I think it's beyond question, a very crucial on a hot topic in the context of green growth strategies. It is uh, only very recently that the European IP Help Desk contributed to a commission study on the tech transfer of green technologies. This study will identify bottlenecks and for the transfer and the commercialization of green technologies developed into the public research organizations within the European Union. So the European IP has, has been involved in this study because there is no doubt technology transfer is closely linked to intellectual property management. IP aspects potentially facilitating or impeding the diffusion of green technologies are key elements of this study, which is currently near finalization. Thus, it is for me uh, with great pleasure to moderate this new or the next session. The main part of the session will be dedicated to five case studies presenting different green innovation journeys. The most significant case, let's say the benefit of case studies, because I have to say I'm really a big fan of case studies, um, the most significant benefit of case studies is that they enable a holistic review. It's not a snapshot with a narrow view on a very specific IP issue. Our case studies today provide the big picture value of a 360 degree IP management practices. So finally, we hope that you connect with our stories and you can benefit from the lessons learned and the main takeaway messages of our IP experts and entrepreneurs presenting today. 
by this. That brings us then directly to the first case study of today. As a very first speaker, I would like to invite Christian, Christian Hackel. He's a member of the European IP help desk team and represents Tumtech GmbH in Germany, located in Munich. And I'm very happy to say good morning to Christian. Christian, are you ready? Yes, Jörg, I'm ready. Uh, thank you very much, Jörg, for your kind introduction. Uh, thanks to Natalia as well. And um, good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome here and uh, welcome to my little story about the company Orkan Energy um, to tell you a little bit about um, how they approached um, the topic. Uh, next slide, please. Here we are talking about waste heat as one aspect of clean tech. Waste heat is basically uh, any heat produced uh, in any process, for example, industrial process, which cannot be used anymore. And it's released to the environment, mostly into the air uh, because it cannot be used, utilized anymore. Um, I've listed a few of the typical waste heat sources, obviously industrial applications, but also power systems, being it a stationary or mobile, for example, also uh, on ships. Um, typical application also the CHP, the combined heat and power plant, uh, power units, and also renewable power plants like biogas, solar thermal, geothermal, where you basically use renewable energy to produce, to produce electricity. They also are a source of waste heat. And um, as you see on the next one, um, it's a big, big topic, waste heat. Um, can you click on it again, please? Uh, yeah, you see, it's really a tremendous amount on a global scale. It's the equivalent of 100 million liters of diesel produced every, every single hour across the globe. So this is really a big, big topic. And that's where uh, the company Orkan Energy uh, comes into play. As you see on the next slide, it's a startup from the Technical University of Munich. It started out as a research group. Um, they found some interesting technical innovations which you could use to address the topic of waste heat. And so um, a bit more than 10 years ago, they founded their startups and today they are almost 70 employees in this company. Um, they have a wide IP portfolio consisting of patents, trademarks, registered designs, and they are quite successful receiving some awards for the design also for their um, innovation work. As you can see on the next slide, yes, their goal is to produce electrical power out of this waste heat, which would have been otherwise released into the environment. Um, well, if you're thinking of the challenge of uh, producing electrical power out of heat, obviously the steam turbine power plant comes to your mind, but this only works for very high temperatures of the waste heat and waste heat normally does not come with such a high temperature. So steam turbine doesn't really help you very much here. Um, however, there's a different system. It's called ORC, different technology. ORC stands for organic Rankine cycle, where you basically use an organic solvent as sort of a um, transfer medium for the, um, for the waste heat. And this helps you uh, to utilize energy from waste with lower temperatures. So basically you already achieved the first goal, but these ORC installation tended to be really big one, really big, big individual installation. So the goal was um, to find a system which is compact, cost efficient, sort of a product, make a product uh, business. And as you can see on the next picture, just a typical um, glimpse, this is a typical ORC installation in industry, so it's really huge installation. Um, next slide, please. So basically the challenge was to go from this huge, big industrial installations, this bespoke installation, go to a standardized product business and obviously reducing the high engineering workload associated with these bespoke installations. Um, Orkan Energy came up with a few very innovative um, aspects, how to uh, deal with this challenge. And for example, one of them was not to develop all new components um, from scratch, but really using existing industrial components, meaning these components 
they are produced for a total different application, but they are produced in high numbers. They have been tested, they are very reliable, and because of the economies of scale, they are much cheaper and much simpler. Um, so this sounds easy, <clears throat> but there are some challenges associated with this aspect. Um, as for example, um, if you talk to an established manufacturer of these industrial components, you have to convince them that you want to use their components for a total different application. And this means, um, yes, you have to convince them uh, to do some testing of their components for a total different application. Um, so this was quite a challenging task because these, well, big companies, they said, hey, you young three students coming up to me, um, it just doesn't work, you know, um, go back, do your homework, read your textbook, um, the new um, idea you are having, it just contradicts the typical um, learning from the textbook, uh, because the aspects what they had in mind in terms of uh, new innovative technology um, doesn't work. Unfortunately, we don't have time here to go into the technical details of the new approach. Um, if we have some engineers in our audience, um, just one uh, topic, cavitation. They had to deal with uh, cavitation. Cavitation can cause a big, big damage to your um, technical components and you want to avoid cavitation for all means. And um, these young students, they come up uh, with innovative um, approaches to avoid the capitations, which contradicted the textbook learning uh, back a few years ago. And that's why it was so difficult to talk to established uh, producers of industrial components. And you needed them for the test of their industrial components for the new application. So yes, main message here, um, <laughs> it was challenging for them. Um, next slide, please. Coming to the topic of IP, intellectual property. IP was very important for Orkan um, for several aspects. The one was, for example, yes, their product was rather easy to reverse engineer. Once you basically had a closer look at um, how Orkan's approach was to solve the problem, it, it's rather easy to reverse engineer. So that's why patent protection is really essential. As mentioned before, this. ORC process, it's an established technology. It's not an invention of the company Orkan. Uh, they used it as a basis and added several uh, sort of innovation to it. So there is no one single patent, for example, for the basic technology like the ORC, but it's a combination of several additional patents. And um, the new features, for example, the components of the control system, um, this is a new aspect which um, was they were able to uh, get a patent protection out of this. So basically this whole bundle resulted uh, in currently 23 patent families and there are more than a hundred granted patents um, around the globe. Next slide, yes, thank you. Um, as mentioned, it started out as a research group at the university. Uh, this means out of these 23 patent families, eight of them, came uh, from the university lab and obviously belonged to the university. So um, the uh, contact and negotiation with the TTO of the university obviously were a very important um, point at the beginning um, of the company Orkan at the startup times. And um, they brought in a venture capitalist rather early. Um, venture capital funding was uh, obviously essential for this startup uh, because it uh, took a lot of uh, time and tackling investments, which were very cost intensive. And obviously for a VC, for a venture capitalists, the patents are really essential. And therefore it was very important that Orcon was able to get a fast access to the patents um, and thus was able to make fast decisions because it may take a while until you convince the venture capitalist that you are a great uh, startup. But once a VC is convinced, they like to move fast. And then you as a startup, you have to move fast. And obviously universities are not so known for fast making decisions. So in this case, it was important for Orkan to move fast and they were able to get a transfer of ownership of these uh, eight patents rather than a license deal, allowing them for really fast decision making. And as I mentioned on this slide here, 
patents are essential for VCs and startups as well. Um, just two more examples. Um, as I mentioned before, it was difficult for the young startup team to go to the established manufacturer of industrial components. Um, they just did not want to listen to them. They said, oh, students go home, read your textbook. It just doesn't work this way. But once the students were able to say, hey, we got a patent from the European Patent Office, at least their counterpart took the time, sit down, listen to the students, and sort of took the time to get into discussion and finally were able um, to be convinced that the new technology of Orkan is very interesting and it would be good uh, for them as, the, as uh, established manufacturer of industrial components to team up with the young startup. So it was basically really sort of a, a quality seal. Um, the patent helped the startup to communicate their, techno, their technical advantage. Uh, and another aspect where the patents at the very beginning were very helpful, Orkan was able um, to apply and win two rather big R&D funding for two projects uh, at a very, very early startup time. And again, the patents were very important for them and helped them to win these two grants. Okay, next slide, please. So basically, they were successful. They were able uh, to get the ORC technology out of these huge bespoke industrial applications to this sort of standardized business. And here you see their EPEC, um, sort of this is one product to produce electricity out of waste heat using the ORC technology. And as you can see on the next slide, a typical installation here, um, this is basically a biogas plant at the very beginning, um, at uh, sorry, at the very back side of the building, you see a little bit of the uh, gas dome of the biogas plant in the building with red roof. Um, you see the, the CHP, the combined heat and power plant. And uh, in the forefront, you see the EPEC, Orkans EPEC, which is used to uh, produce electricity out of the waste heat produced by the uh, CHP, which would normally be released into the environment, into the air. And here, Orkan's EPEC can take up this um, waste heat and produce additional electricity. Okay, um, very quick look going international since we are here in a sort of international uh, setting for Orkan. Um, it was a big question, how to address large international markets like China? They were too small to cover them on their own. So they had two options, give up a huge potential market or find a good local partner. Good all is basically a partner with a strong market presence in, in China, for example, and having a common understanding of a technology and uh, doing business. Uh, next slide, please. They teamed up with a Chinese partner, formed a joint venture with this Chinese partner, granted a license um, for the technology and know-how, but with this license, they were rather selective keeping some of the core technology to Orkan, at least for the time being, and only giving some sort of less critical technology um, through uh, this license. And the license was exclusive for Asia and Africa. And as you can see from the manufacturing, marketing, sales and maintenance. Um, next slide, please, how it works. Basically the core components with the core technology, they are being built in Germany by Orkan, then shipped to the joint venture other components are added in China. Um, then the full product is shipped to the customer side, installed by the Chinese partner, because the Chinese partner, they know uh, all of the local demands. And with this setting, they had a very, very big first success, a huge installation in Myanmar, um, where they had uh, 70 gas turbines of the Chinese partner plus the ORC from Orkan. And so on the next slide, it's basically a summary of the journey of Orkan um, from the single installations in Germany. Next one, please. As you see on the next two pictures, this product, next one, please. Uh, typical installation, as I told you, one single EPEC next to one installation. Click on it, please, again. Again and again. To the large installation in, in Asia, this is a much, much bigger product of Orca now, uh, much bigger than the previous smaller installation. And the last picture, as you can see here, 
uh, that's the huge installation in Myanmar. Um, if you look sort of at the very foreground on the left hand side with the three sort of round um, exhaust shapes on it, this would be uh, the gas turbine of the Chinese partner and sort of these two rows in the middle, that's the Orkan overseas. And you see Orkan used to sell one small product at a time and here they had one project with 70s huge large insta, um, um, products from Orkan. So basically that's it, 15 minutes uh, sharp. Um, if you like to read a little bit more, I had the honor of writing two case studies, the first one for the EPO. Uh, you can search for them. If you search EPO and SMEs case studies, you find them. And the second case study on the next slide, um, it's on the aspect of going international licensing out to China. It's a case study you find on the European IP help desk. And with this, thank you very much for your attention and I'm giving back to Jörg. Thank you very much, Christian, for your um, for your valuable insights in uh, in the Orkan journey of innovation. I like very much the, the part that you stressed that uh, about the credibility of patents to uh, convince investors, especially for startups or young young entrepreneurs. I know that we received a couple of questions, so we will keep them, and then we will have at the end of the session we will have a roundtable discussion, and then of course Christian is able to answer to them. Um, then right after the, the last presentations. Now, what we see now, what we see now in, in the Orkan case was that there was, has been a technology developed at a European university, and then it has been used for a startup activity. And then finally, the decision was made to reach out for the international, uh, for internationalization. And that's actually also something now we will have, we will have a similar story now. Uh, of course, in a, in a different field of technology than from Portugal. And this story then will be told by Daniel. Daniel is an ambassador of the European IP Help Desk. And he is going to tell us, yeah, what are the different IP and business challenges faced by a European clean tech company when expanding in international markets. I'm, I'm very happy that also that uh, one of our in, uh, ambassadors is contributing to this workshop today. You know, our ambassador scheme um, consists of 48 uh, European IP help desk ambassadors from 28 countries. And they help us to have a better outreach to for IP awareness and IP training all over Europe or to SMEs all over Europe. So by this, I just give the floor to Daniel and yeah, happy to meet you. Hi, good morning, York. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. And it's my pleasure to, to say you good morning from Portugal and to share with you a case study from, from here. Uh, and I, the first thing that I should say is that clean tech is not, is not new, is not a thing from the Green Deal. And our, our case from that I will show you in minutes, uh, it starts a long time ago. I, I was a child at that time. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so it is a case of the advanced cyclone system. The first thing that I should say you is what is a cyclone? A cyclone is, is this device that we have on the left side, and it is used to separate um, things that are in the air. So we have an inside, an influx that is air with particles. So it can comes from a, a boiler uh, with uh, almost all this dirty and dust. And you can use the cyclone for two purposes. One is to reduce and to to get your emissions very controlled. Okay and where the clean air goes on top and all the dust is collected on the bottom. But on other industries, such as in pharma and foods, you, have, you are interested in the recovery of this product since they are very expensive. This is the work of a professor at the University, University of Porto. Uh, he had a long research line on that. And in 1998, he filed a Portuguese provisional patent on, on that. Uh, he goes for a European patent application and in 2007, uh, the patent was granted. At that time, there was few patents uh, in Portugal and in, in, the, in, and in the industry. It is not now, uh, nowadays that situation is much, much better, but that was a critical for the next steps. 
Why? Because this professor and entrepreneur, uh, he goes into an acceleration program where he met the, the, the current CEO of the Advanced Cyclonic Systems company. The professor is the CTO and the co-founder. And together, they go to the acceleration program. They do the product market fit analysis. They got the pilots and they use the, the, the Python to convince the venture capital to go in. So they, they, are, they have now 16 employers and they are in, in uh, 37 countries worldwide. They, they decide to internationalize very soon. Next slide, please. Because uh, they are in a very competitive market. They, are, they try, so the customers in this, in this market, they look for efficiency and for costs regarding the maintenance and, and operation. So there are other types of cyclones that are not that efficient. And you have on the top the filters. And so advanced, the, the value proposition of ACS is to have a very good efficiency, okay, at a, a certain low cost. On the right, we have a, a, just an example of industrial installation in, in South America. Okay, next slide, please. And but live is, is very hard. And if you remember, the, the, the patent that was filed in 1998 is expired now. Okay, so they, they have an holistic approach of IP. They, they have uh, um, three patent families, one per technology. So the Hurricane, Ricyclone MH and Ricyclone EH. Uh, they, they filed some trademarks applications, but nowadays their most valuable assets in, in terms of IP are the software that they have the copyrights and the source code. But on top of that, it is a trade secret because very few people inside the company can access to the software and the know-how. And these assets allow them to develop new cyclones in a very fast way. So their develop, develop proposition is not taking too much time developing because what is important in cyclone is, are the proportion between the side diameters and, uh, and the height. And it depends on the, the number and the inflow, the types of particles, if they are hard or not, because there are a lot of chemical reactions inside the cycle. And all of that have a huge impact on the efficiency of collecting the particles on the bottom. So with this situation, with the software, they are now very fast and they have a technology, a platform technology. So they, they, they are not relying on the first First patent anymore. They can compete in the market with other patents because they, they did as Orcan, so they didn't patent just the, the full technology. So they have several patents for um, some complements with lasers and so on. And with that, they are doing a, a very, a very uh, personalized, customized approach to the market. So they, they are now exploiting new markets, as I told you, in pharma. Uh, and all kinds of industry in a very user-centric design because it is very complex um, to solve these problems. Okay, they have to have a huge know-how in chemical engineering to develop a very good cyclone. And with that, they have a competitive, competitive advantages. Uh, okay, IP, how strong is IP? And it depends on, on, the, on the contracts, all right? So in, in, in some territories where, uh, like in the US, in Europe, they, they have a, a strong importance and uh, they help a lot at, at doing. Uh, in other markets, they have to, to, to rely and complement with, with other kind of contracts. So when you have a patent, you, you have to, to be aware that uh, you, you should fine tuning uh, in the country where you are doing the business. Next slide, please. And so Advanced Cyclone Systems is now in 37 and working with very, very big companies. Um, they, they, okay, they, they use the IP to compete internationally. Uh, it is a, a niche, okay? It is not a huge market, but there is a trend. As we know, all these uh, legal impositions and the Green Deal, it's, it's, it's a very uh, good opportunity to them to keep growing and to expanding to other markets that are, are not in, the, in their map now. Next slide, please. As an ambassador, my mission is to connect with people. So uh, when Portuguese SMEs or other SMEs contact me, 
what the benefit they have is because I have several several roles. Okay, I'm the head of technology licensing office at Inesh Tech. I'm also part of other networks. Uh, I'm professor at the faculty for economics and, and management, and I, I have a past as a, a biomedical researcher. So to me, it's easy to understand their needs and to connect someone that can help them at creating value, at being informed about IP. And that is uh, the impact of uh, an ambassador. Next slide, please. And we have also an in-house case. So from this lesson, the lessons learned with, with this case of the ECS, we develop a software that is based on artificial intelligence algorithm that is with a, a Portuguese company called Agros de Atlantic. So it is wastewater treatment. And what the software do is to optimize the water level because um, as close as you are from the top, uh, the more energy you save and wastewater treatment plants consume a lot of energy uh, so this 20 percent savings it represents a huge economical impact on the efficiency of these processes uh, next slide please okay but um, this this e-predator software was generated in a wage h 2020 project as a joint ownership so it uh, imposes uh, several challenges to doing a proper IP management. So all the, the helpline and the European IP help desk, the fact sheets and the webinars were crucial for Inesh Tech and for all the partners to be trained in these issues because for the company, it was the first time that they were dealing with an IP question. Uh, on top of that, we are talking about a computer implemented invention so this, this uh, close link with the European Patent Organization was very, very important to discuss the two-world approach and, and what should be patent or not. Uh, software, it, it complies with a lot of different IPRs, so the database, the source code, also the open source compliance and the trade secrets are all there and, and it should be clear for all involved partners what should be protected or not. Uh, the internationalization, our partner wants to go to China and India. So uh, the connection with other IPL texts and the PCT with from IPO are also critical, uh, important tools. And of course, uh, some guidance on the trademark FTO, uh, are using TM, team view and also some guidelines from your IPO. So IP and European IPL tests are really connected in the case of ePredator. Next slide, please. And to, to conclude, some lessons learned from these, uh, from these cases. So the first point that I should mention to you is that clean tech is not optional, right? So we should be aware that, and they will be there, but they are with us for a long time, as we see from the ACS case. Um, data is also key in this, digital technologies. So um, you should be, uh, be prepared to share your success with, with companies or partners that will provide you high quality data to train your machine learning algorithms. So uh, that is a, a challenge and people are not aware of that. Um, please, uh, SMEs have a lot of, of very important stories and very important lessons learned. So read them as, as your, as your and Christian presented to us because they, they really inspired and they inspired me in this e predator case. Uh, look at your competitors, so be in the real world. Uh, and never forget that uh, you should mention that do a uh, value driven IP management. Okay, uh, don't patent because of the CV or uh, political reasons. Understand the business uh, that you want to protect and do it in this way. And just to conclude, next slide, just contacts from the companies and, and the Inesh Tech. And thank you very much for your time. And the floor is yours, Simon. Your, thank you very much for the chance. Thank you, Daniel. That was great. And I would just take the opportunity also to welcome and to give a big thank you to the whole group of our European IP Hatters ambassadors. So we need yeah, them. They are great. 
They are great. They do a perfect job. And we really, they are an important pillar of the whole scheme of the European IP help desk, not only the European one, but also all the international help desks. So um, I'm sure we will have time in a roundtable discussion to go into, to dig into one of the details, which, which you mentioned before. Um, but just after having received this brilliant overview about IP challenges that exist, as well as the modes to utilize them to enhance competitiveness and success, now we will take a closer look at some case studies from uh, our international help desks in which they provided this free of charge services. In doing so, we'll highlight experience then from Southeast Asia, that's the first one, Latin American and Japan. So the first case study will now be presented by Mark Peters from Bamboo News Avada and our colleague Benoit Tardy uh, from the Southeast Asia IP SME Help Desk. So uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for welcoming us. I am uh, Benoit Tardy and uh, I will be uh, having a discussion uh, with uh, Mr. Mark Peters, uh, partner of, uh, and founder of Bamboo Nusa Verde. So uh, next slide, please. And now I'll leave uh, all the floor to uh, Mr. Mark Peters to present a bit of his company and uh, tell us a bit uh, what was the idea of founding a company, why you choose Indonesia as a destination for the business, what kind of services did, do the company offer? Um, well, briefly explain a bit more of your uh, company and its activities. Okay, thank you, Benoit. Hello, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Mark Peters. Um, I came in 1977 to Indonesia already, only for three weeks, and I'm still stuck here. So I must like it here. Now, um, after being in telecommunications for 30 years, I wanted to do something else, looking to something green, and I found that in bamboo. That is why the company is Bamboo Nusa Verde. So we make bamboo plants. Nobody of not many uh, firms do that. In university you do that, but on a commercial basis, it's not happening a lot. You can count the companies that do that on your hand, one hand. Yeah, the next slide, please. We um, originate out of Belgium. Um, we. Uh, uh, based our technology on uh, Oprins. Uh, we are for the moment not anymore linked to Oprins, um, but still to Mr. Jan Oprins, who was the creator of the tissue culture, the creator of making bamboo plants in a bottle. So um, we continued the technology into uh, to do that in uh, Indonesia, in uh, Dog Jakarta. Why he chose, next slide please, um, why he chose uh, Indonesia? Because yeah, it's very fertile here. There is a big market. There is a lot of land, and um, bamboo is a pioneer plant, and it's um, greener than any other plant. So, but why we do this? Why we make bamboos in a bottle? Uh, it's because uh, bamboos never or seldom have seeds. So, um, a bamboo is uh, flowering maybe every 70 years, 90 years, 100 years. There are even species that don't flower or never recorded that they were flowering. So when they are flowering, they create the seeds and then the seeds you can um, plant, grow again new bamboos. But uh, this is seldom, so you have to wait maybe forever in order to have one typical bamboo um, flowering. So you can do that on branch cuttings, like in the middle of the side, uh, slide, but this you cannot make a volume. You are in volume, you can only make by the technology what we have, and then you can put a nursery full with bamboo and plant everywhere. Where we export these uh, plants, uh, in the, uh, we export it all over the world. Uh, we make um, Africa green, we also send to South America, we send to Europe, Australia, and of course, in Asia and Indonesia. Yeah, next. Yeah, here is, um, you see the bamboos are very small, they are growing in a bottle. Uh, and then the, we have a lot of operators, we have uh, 13 operators uh, working to, uh, to do these handlings. And uh, by that, yeah, in tropical bamboos, uh, I think we are uh, maybe one of the biggest. We make a total of 40 different species, of which half is or ornamental, most of it for uh, Australian market. But the rest is really industrial bamboo, which you can use for 
making um, energy, uh, um, biomass. You can use it for uh, making flooring, like we know from China, it's uh, muscle, but also make textile. You can make paper from it, charcoal, even uh, bio, bio uh, energy, biogas you can make from it. Yo, the next. So this is, uh, we grow them uh, in the laboratory and then we plant them out in, out in the greenhouses and then eventually in the, in the nursery. And so we have in total uh, 18,000 square meters. We have 500,000, up to 500,000 bamboos in stock. And those uh, are sent out over uh, the world. In smaller sizes, maximum 30 centimeters. And for the local market, we send out uh, plants ready to plant 80 centimeters. Yep, next. So how it's uh, done, and then we come to uh, our uh, worries and why I contacted uh, and, uh, Benoit and team in Vietnam. So how we do that, uh, we have uh, two different processes. I show we only one here, and that is we take out of a butt of a bamboo, then we put it in a special media, and then we hope that the bamboo, this piece that we cut out of the bamboo, that it is still thinking that it is on the bamboo uh, plant and that it starts growing into the bottle. If that is working, then we, uh, we go to a multiplication that's in the center. And then if that is working again, so the bamboo is it's quite difficult to, to do this process because of contaminations happening into the plant. The, ba the bamboo is uh, very high, exposed to contaminations more than any other plants. Again, the reason why not so many uh, in institutions or companies do this, and then on the right side, uh, that's uh, so in the middle, and the top on the middle, it's uh, the bamboo is growing, is growing without roots. And then we put in uh, roots, and uh, on the next um, uh, figure, I'll have a picture. And then if it's big enough, then uh, if the root is well developed, then we put in the in tunnels, and then they grow up until the middle. Then it's called a plug, which is 30 centimeters, which is sent all over the world or and we grow it up further till 80 or one meter and that is planted, can be planted around Java or in Indonesia when there is a possibility to ship by truck. So again, this uh, process is uh, quite uh, difficult because every species has a different treatment. They need an, another protocol, they need another media composition in order to grow. So um, we uh, were very much concerned how we can do that since everybody is talking now about bamboo in, uh, in textile, bamboo in, uh, for, to make everything green. So um, it means that we should have uh, started or we started to think about how to protect our uh, processes, how to protect our name because many start to use our name even as uh, the producer of tissue culture, but they buy our plants and then they sell it under their name as tissue cultures and they don't do the process. So um, that is uh, the reason why I, I was uh, in contact with uh, the team in Vietnam. How can we do that? Next, please. Okay, th thank you very much, Mark, for yeah. this continual company. So now yeah. we will jump into uh, the core uh, IP uh, issues. So in fact, uh, we remember you uh, because uh, uh, you decided to approach and get in contact with the IP, well, the SEA, IP SME help desk. Could you tell us a bit more about uh, how did you met us? And, uh... Yes, uh, we, we met, uh, the, there was a seminar here in, uh, in Jakarta where uh, you uh, made a presentation on uh, intellectual property rights and how it could be uh, protected in what way. So with patents or, uh, or uh, registering uh, the, the technology in what way. So um, we continued the discussion that during the months and then we made up our minds that um, first of all, we have to register our name like I told already. They use this bamboo nusa verden as a, as a reference, since the the bamboo is totally different and performs totally different in the field, uh, in growth wise and yield wise and uh, uh, speed wise. So um, then, so, uh, so, so, so basically, basically it was that you were already worrying a bit for the future and wanted to uh, obtain maybe some protection before uh, growing up the business. 
Yes, yes, that's right. And then we have to look to a patent, but the patent again, there you have to disclose all the details and that we didn't want to do. So uh, we opted uh, for, uh, first of all, registering our name, uh, but that is on your advice. Uh, so, um, the, and that we could protect. And then eventually, if we ever will share our technology to a third party to do the same in other countries, how we could do that. Um, uh, so uh, how we could protect our trade secrets and that again with non-disclosure agreement and a confidentiality agreement with it, uh, the third party should give us some, some kind of protection. Because one of, of the biggest concern was either to use a patent, but in fact it was already existing patent and you were like improving the patent and also we advise you to more um, follow the trade secret part, confidentiality, secrecy. Yes, right. Yeah, so that uh, we did do that, uh, we registered our name. Uh, you saw that in the previous slide, we have Bambo Nusaverde logo is registered and then BBIT, BBIT. This is uh, Bamboo Bio Biotechnology, which uh, is also registered. Uh, it's uh, currently in the uh, registration office of the uh, Intellectual Property Indonesia. Rights uh, Division in, in Jakarta. And, okay. and so, so, so basically, uh, these are uh, actions that were taken uh, just after uh, just after uh, we spoke. And you also uh, managed to get uh, some information from other official sources. Uh, yes, but uh, in fact, uh, we, we try to find out ourselves, most of it, thanks to your guidance, uh, how it's done in Indonesia and what is the best way to do it in Indonesia. So for that, I must uh, sincerely thank you to, to guide us uh, along the way. And that's what we have for the moment. So we can we, we have this BBIT register. So it means that our plants can take uh, behind the name of the, the Latin name of the bamboo. We can put BBIT. So everybody will know BBIT from where it comes BBIT. It is from uh, Bambu Nusa Verde and that's a brand name. And and this is uh, from the trademark and trade secret perspective. But uh, I remember also that uh, you were uh, registering species uh, before the Ministry of Agriculture. Could you yes, tell us a bit more about the, yes, about the, the, yeah. the, the in order to uh, get recognized uh, by the government, we had to do something special, uh, and that is uh, to uh, get an approval of a plant that was made in the laboratory with all the characteristics around it, how big it was, how it grows, what color it has, and all that. So uh, we do, do, do that. It's uh, quite a long process also. It has been verified, and that has been certified. So we have two. Uh, key species, one is an or ornamental, another one is distribu an, an industrial species, which uh, carries now the name of Bibit, and we give a code and even behind that. So it's very clear that uh, this is a bamboo coming from us in, um, well, know, with these and these characteristics. And you will, uh, in the future, continue to protect some other species, maybe some other trademarks, or it will depend on the evolution of the business. Yes, uh, first of all, I think we have to register our name and then we can see if we, we're going we to protect the protocols, maybe how the protocol is made. Uh, in, and then also the NDA that we, we will register it in the trade department so that there is a kind of protection based on, on your guidelines at that time. And would you say, like, on, uh, in order to wrap it up, like on the impact uh, towards you and your company, uh, how is now the level of awareness, your knowledge about IP, is it uh, better? Do you know now how to uh, get the data, uh, who to contact, or maybe um, collaborate with some uh, local uh, lawyers in Indonesia? Yeah, sure, we will do. Huh? Uh, but the key is, again, I have the name if it's, uh, it's registered in the database of the Ministry of Law and Justice. If that is out, then uh, we can move to the next step and I uh, will definitely contact you and others here to see uh, what is the next uh, step to, to protect us better for the future. And would you um, tell people or other SMEs uh, that it's important uh, to protect their intellectual property or just wait until 
a um, possible potential uh, uh, litigation starts because many people think, well, let's uh, save costs and wait until the uh, like, later stage. No, definitely not. Uh, this is a key, I think, uh, for working in, in Asia because in Asia, Asian is an, a copy country, yeah? so we were also afraid that uh, one time uh, we lose an, uh, one of our, uh, our experts and they start to copy, to copy our, uh, our uh, way of working uh, in the street, uh, in the next street uh, behind us. Yeah? So that's again also the reason why we do this. Yeah? Okay, perfect. So uh, for you, it's not like as uh, we remember that uh, you were talking uh, at first with the eldest and you were more thinking about only patents and now yes. for you it's like building an ip strategy combining different sources of and different type of intellectual property rights and not only patents for example right thank you right so your understanding uh, was like evolving yes so, that's okay. true <laughs> okay <laughs> perfect yeah. can we go to the uh, last slide please Okay, so here is, uh, if you want to hear more about Bamboo Nusa Verde, if you want to ask questions, technical questions, or even if you have some uh, ideas for partnering up with Mark Peters and uh, his company. So feel free to contact him. And I don't know if Mark, you want to add something before we leave the floor to uh, the others? No, I just want to add, uh, Bamboo Nusa Verde is quite unique. We have a total system, we have a system set up, uh, the laboratory. Uh, we can do more things for the moment. We are uh, investigating to do Ratan. So we will then have Rabbit as a, as a brand name and also Coconut. So Coconut is also on, on market and then it will go, go bit. it will be Cbit. Uh, so uh, anybody who's interested to know more, uh, look to our website or send an email to info Bamanusa Verde, and then we can talk. And uh, uh, we are a green company. Eh? We are making the world green. Uh, and we, we produce uh, plants that will take out uh, the global warming or make the global warming a, a, a little bit less. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. And we leave uh, the floor back to uh, York or maybe Cesar from Latin. Not just me. Thank you very much. Okay. For the both of you, I mean, it was a very inspiring and lively discussion about a really green success story from uh, from Indonesia. I think uh, what was very important uh, is, of course, that again it it was uh, emphasized on the fact that a sound IP strategy has much more to offer than just patenting. So I think it's thank you, big 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 thank you to Mark that he took the time. Uh, to present um, his business, I think it's uh, it's definitely an advantage to talk directly to the to the entrepreneur who puts everything into action. And thank you, uh, Benoit, for guiding the discussion. So now we move directly forward to Simo and Cesar presenting a very interesting uh, biotech or case from uh, a biotech startup in Finland. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jorg. Good morning, everyone. Hello from those of you who are seeing us streaming as there's no alternative. We used to see each other's faces. Now this is not the case. We miss you anyway. And now I'm very pleased to be here today because today I'm bringing you one of those companies that when you know about their story, you simply fall in love with them. It was my case. When I heard about it, I just started thinking, wow, this, I have to bring this example to everyone as they are simply doing things right and we got with me today a uh, the ceo and one of the five co-founders of this company named enifer bio and is simo elila who is in charge of this and if i'm really so proud of how they are doing things it is no wonder due to the skillful person who's in charge of this as simo is very is um familiar with five languages he's been in four countries and he had to deal with sales product management contractual issues and what's more important today with intellectual property so with all this background which is primarily focused on biorefining and biotech and really worried about sustainability Simo founded with four of his colleagues a startup based in Finland almost two years ago, but I guess that he's the best person to introduce what this company is doing, what's the story of this very interesting SME, and many other things. Simo, very welcome. Thanks a lot, Cesar. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Yeah, so um, as, as as I mentioned in his introduction, I'm the CEO of uh, Enerfer Bio. We are a startup based in Espoo, Finland, just outside the capital. Um, so I would just like to correct that actually the company was founded only about eight months ago officially, but uh, the, the company has a lot longer history. Uh, in, in the short term, we, we were operating under uh, BTT, the Technical Research Center of Finland, which is one of the main research and technology organizations in Europe, um, in an incubator program called Launchpad. Uh, but then the technology itself has an even a lot longer history. So we are actually dealing with a, a technology that was developed uh, here in Finland uh, already starting in the 1960s. Uh, so the pulp and paper industry is hugely important up here uh, in the Nordics. We have a lot of, a lot of timber, not much else. Um, and uh, back in the 60s and 70s, they used to produce a lot of something known as uh, spent sulfide liquor, a kind of side stream when you're making paper and cellulose that, that was kind of wasted. It was actually an environmental problem back in the day. And they developed a unique bioprocess to treat that side stream where you, you have this um, very uh, specific microfungus called, uh, that was eventually called Bekilo, uh, uh, with which was, it was the name of the organism, but also about the process and the product that was later produced using this process. So as, as is shown in this slide, so essentially what, what the process does is it takes a very dilute uh, industrial side stream, like the original spent sulfate liquor, you feed it into bioreactor. In the bioreactor, uh, the peculo microfungus is growing. It consumes a lot of the organics, thus purifying the water. And at the other end of the continuous process, you can harvest the fungus uh, very efficiently using filtration and then dry it. And presto, you have animal feed. So you're hitting two birds with one stone, essentially. You're, you're, you're purifying a side stream from a biorefining process and you're adding value by creating a new valuable product. So this is pretty unique for a startup that we actually have a process that has an industrial history. We're not bringing something you know, that we uh, concocted up in the lab yesterday, but this is actually something that was running at industrial scale for more than 15 years. Unfortunately, it was shut down in 1991 uh, because simply because the si original side stream ran, uh, ran dry. There was no more spent sulfide liquor being produced in Finland, and the, thus the process was shelved. That's due to the changes in the, in the pulping industry processes. So the idea behind our company is that we, we saw that there is a ready industrially validated process here. Um, and because, of, as, as I mentioned, I've, I've, I've um, lived abroad, I've lived in Latin America, in fact, in, in Brazil for more than three years, I'm quite uh, familiar with the global biorefining industry. So I knew that there are suitable biorefining bio side streams available today, and this process could be re-implemented. The other factor, key factor, is that we're targeting a new market, which is aquaculture. So we're planning to make fish feed. Uh, the original product was sold as uh, feed for chicken and, and, and pigs. Whereas this is now targeted at the high value aquafeed market, which does miracles for the pro uh, profitability of the process because fish feed is, is far more valuable. So that's in a nutshell what we do. We, we develop this process and we plan to implement it to convert side streams from biorefining into aquaculture feed. This is really good. You mentioned Latin America for a good reason. And I think that for strategic reasons, as I mentioned that you are doing things really right, and you are kind of a prize stage, you're trying to go international, uh, we cannot name the, the countries you are addressing for obvious reasons, but I guess that Latin America is anyway, one of your interesting areas. Uh, why so? Um, well, there's several obvious reasons. One is that, we, of course, we, we need raw material to produce our fungus, and, and Latin America is simply, you can say that it's the, it's the breadbasket of the world, it's what you know, Brazil, uh, Argentina, these are huge agricultural powerhouses. Uh, and many of, the, many of the raw material streams that they produce today are inefficiently used. So you could, you could extract a lot more value from that uh, and, and improve the sustainability of the processes that are implemented there. But of course, also we, we want to produce locally. So if, if we were to implement our process in Latin America, we would like to serve a local market. And aqu aquaculture is, um, is also a big business in South America and Latin America. Oh, I see. And I couldn't help noticing that in the previous slide, it was shown Pekilo has a small R. So it is a registered trademark, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So, um, of course, as, as I mentioned, we only registered the company eight months ago um, and we 
really got started after our seed round in October. Uh, and one of the first things is you do as a company is register your trademark. So we, we got started in Finland and from there we're expanding um, the, the registration of the trademark to relevant markets uh, in the EU. Uh, and then we were, we were looking at markets that might be of interest to us and then we, we just we noticed that it's not that straightforward in certain markets. Um, in Latin America, there are several countries that are not part of the so-called Madrid Agreement, mm -hmm. which allows you to, let's say, directly uh, through, through one system to expand your, your trademark registration. So um, that's kind of where we, we started to struggle. Of course, we're a small company, limited resources. Uh, we can't take care of everything ourselves. So we were really wondering, like, how do we, how do we approach these markets? And that's where we, we found you, of course. Yeah, it was, and we were so happy you to contact us. And it, yes, I agree with you that it is no secret that international trademark registration in Latin America is kind of a pending task. I hope that the policymakers are listening to us. It can help you in doing this a little bit easier so you can do that yourself, although it's not maybe the best case to you. But anyway, it is pretty noticeable that intellectual property is key for you and your company. But why is it so? What is so important? You we know trademark is absolutely key. It's kind of protecting your name, but why else? Yeah, so trademarks, obviously, we, we want to build a brand around our, our product that is recognizable. Uh, people would associate it with, with sustainability and aquaculture. But then on, on the IP side, of course, uh, when we're talking about biotech, it's, it's all about IP. It's all about patents. Uh, it's about protecting your, uh, your inventions, uh, making sure that they cannot be copied at the same time ensuring that you have the freedom to operate uh, in, in what you're doing. Um, it's, of course, we are at heart, we are a technology company and, and what we do is, is, is develop the technology and in the future, we might in several cases see uh, that our business model is actually licensing and, and to license something we need to have IP. Uh, of course, it's also important for, as a startup, uh, for, for building up your valuation uh, and, and ensuring that you, you're able to raise uh, more funds as, as, as your company uh, always needs when you expand. And you mentioned, you, you said it the right thing. If you don't have your rights registered, you cannot license anything. You have nothing, nothing to license. No one would buy, give you a pen. If you don't have something exclusive, that is what intellectual property provides you with. And I'm really glad that you contact us and that a company like yours that is really handling so many things at a time and you are particularly in charge of these relationships and with dealing with stakeholders and managing the core business of it. And you found us, so I'm, I'm really glad you do that. And why is it so important for a company like yours to have this kind of services at their disposal? Um, yeah, um, as, as I briefly mentioned, of course, when you're starting a new company, you have uh, limitations both in, in terms of, of uh, available funding and, and of staff. So. Uh, so you, you just simply cannot do everything yourself. There's there's a lot to do and, and, and not enough resources to cover all of it. So all of these kind of services, are, of course, uh, they a way to expand what, what you can do. And, and I think it's really, really great. And I was really happy. I, I suddenly remembered seeing one of your presentations at an at a EU event. And, and I'm really glad that I contacted you. And I'm actually really glad for your invitation here because I was not aware that this service also exists for Southeast Asia which is also of interest to us. So I, I know where to call next. <laughs> so this event really worked. We made the connection. We let the people know your case study and many of the attendees would have learned the basis of a good driven uh, business like yours. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm going to call Becky you up during the panel discussions. But anyway, should any person willing to have more information about this company or getting any partnering or a license, they can contact you directly. And if for bio, you get the, the details on the first slide. It's going to be shared anyway. Thank you very much for being here. Keep you posted. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Cesar, for bringing up this, this very, very interesting case study. And a big thank you to Simo, a very fresh entrepreneur who took some time for us. And I think we, we learned a lot from your valuable contribution. So I would also just like to stress the fact that um, this uh, new company has also been somehow created um, during an incubation service of VTT. So the VTT Launchpad, I think that's very interesting for us also for the help desk that we uh, collaborate more and more with such regional, local or national incubation services. And we provide 
complementary expertise when it comes really to support the new companies, the new startups, which are incubated um, in this uh, local um, environment with specific IP knowledge. So I think that's very important to know that it works, that we have this kind of the innovation ecosystem running all over Europe. And we see that more and more incubation services like the one from, from Finland are building up in all the European countries. So now we go on and I think it's uh, my pleasure that last but not least, I would like to welcome Nicole, Nicole Bigler and, and Luca, who uh, will provide us um, the Japanese experience, uh, the experiences from the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Jörg. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you very yeah, well. Excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the colleagues uh, for having me here, me and Nicole. Thank you, of course, to all the attendees. I can see that there are a lot of you uh, still with us after more than one hour. So thanks much. Uh, here in, uh, in Tokyo is 6.48 p.m. Uh, so almost the end of the day. Uh, I will not steal too much time from Nicole that is actually going to talk about uh, a case from a recent past. Uh, so I just want to uh, introduce very briefly the services of the help desk that maybe are not that known, especially to all of you, uh, all of those that are in Europe. Uh, so maybe the next slide I can. Um, perfect. Okay. So the help desk is a, a service of the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation, which is a joint venture between the European Commission and METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Investment here in Japan. So the good thing for the help desk is that being within uh, a bigger structure, which is uh, whose purpose is to help SMEs uh, come to Japan from Europe and from Japan going to Europe, uh, is actually pretty good because as I will explain in, uh, in a second, uh, you can benefit from very different services, not just IP related services. But speaking about the help desk, as you can see here in the slide, uh, the target audience is Cosme related uh, and Japanese companies. So companies, individuals, research centers, universities that are based in a cosmic country or in Japan. And the objective, of course, is to understand all the mechanics about IP, how to uh, understand uh, and uh, perform a technology transfer deal, learn more about IP, and in general, uh, also matchmaking activities. We have a separate website from the one of the center, which is here uh, on the slide, eu-jp-tthelpdesk.eu where you can find a lot of interesting materials that I will show you in, uh, in the next slide. So please, if I can see, thank you. Um, we have, uh, we decided to, uh, let's say, follow the so-called pull and push approach. So in the, on the push side, we help universities and research centers promote their technologies and they can be uploaded on the website. It's very easy as a, you can see here, it literally takes five minutes. If you go on the homepage, there is a section called uh, Submit Your Technology. Of course, if you want to be in touch with me, you can, you can do so. You can send me an email, we can talk, and then you can decide to upload as a technology manager uh, your technology from the university or the research center. We will also create a section for you for the institution, for the logo and everything. So your institution, as long as there is one uh, technology that is available, we'll have a page and a section on the website. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, opposite side of the, the push is the pull, as you may know. Uh, so we help companies uh, in trying to get in touch with researchers and with universities and research centers to find technologies or skills uh, in research areas that uh, need for the companies some, uh, some help. So constantly we publish our own request for proposal or we republish uh, requests for proposal from partners that are constantly seeking for help. And uh, so you can see on the uh, section of the website dedicated to this, that there are some deadlines that they say uh, each request for proposal, all the details, how you have to apply, what are the requirements for the, uh, the proposal in terms of length, language, documents, etc. So everything is there. But again, if you have a question, I'm here uh, to, to answer all the questions you might have. Next slide, please. Yes. So we have really a lot of resources and the center has different services. So there are different websites where you can get uh, more information. If you go on the general website of the center, which is www.eu-japan.eu, 
you can find all the information about all the different help desks because we run several of them. Uh, and from there, you can go to the uh, different websites. On my website, you can find information about the past webinars, seminars that we had, of course, physically here in Tokyo, uh, reportage of the events that uh, the team uh, has attended here in mostly in Japan, fact sheets that we prepare with uh, partner law firms and IP firms, mostly here in Japan, and also podcasts. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, this uh, brings me now to uh, the moment which I have to introduce you to Nicole. Nicole is a member of Sonoden Kobayashi, which is a leading IP firm in, uh, in Japan and Tokyo. And um, we have been working as a help desk uh, now for maybe three or four years with Sonoden Kobayashi that helped us in many different ways in uh, creating this uh, so-called IPR support program, which allows companies and individuals to be in touch with us for uh, a pro bono uh, IPR support program, which means you can have a conversation with a patent attorney. And then of course you will know whether or not uh, it's possible for you to maybe file an application here in Japan, where are the different routes, how much time it takes, costs of course, and everything of course is confidential and you don't have to, uh, you are not committed. So of course, if you don't want to move on, uh, you're free to do so. Um, Last but not least, we have a lot of uh, a social media network channels. So we have a LinkedIn page, Facebook page, Twitter, of course. So I would like you to start following us if you don't do it yet, especially from, from, your, from Europe. And uh, again, here you can see my contact details. Feel free to be in touch. You can also find my uh, email on the website. But if you want to take a note here for a second, please do uh, take a note and remember my email if you want to be in touch. Uh, I'm done for today. I would love to introduce you so to Nicole Bigler uh, from Sonoden Kobayashi. She will talk uh, about a case of the recent past. Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's nice to meet all of you. And um, thank you very much for having me. As Luca mentioned, I'm with Sonoden Kobayashi IP Law. Uh, we are a boutique IP firm based in Tokyo and in Beijing. And we are specialized in helping companies protecting their intellectual property rights in Japan and in China. So um, that's enough about us. Could you please go to the next slide? Thank you very much. So today I would like to introduce to you a case on a rather bigger scale. Um, both companies involved, Honeywell, a US-based company, and Arkema, a France-based company, are multinational entities. And the dispute I'm going to explain is not only happening in Japan, but on a global level. The reason I have picked this case is that it involves an important green technology and both parties can be said to be acting in the name of environmental protection. I would like to show you what happened to their IP rights in Japan specifically. First, a little bit background, however. So before the mid 2000s, automobile manufacturers used a re refrigerant called HSC 134A for automobile air conditioners. This gas had been used for coolant, but it was known to create ozone holes in the atmosphere and many governments became alert about the gas considering it to be bad. In 2003, however, and onwards, um, Honeywell started filing patent applications on the use of HFO 1234YF, an automobile air conditioning known to be less harmful to the environment. In 2006, global warming concerns prompted the European Union to enact new regulations regarding automobile to use refrigerants with low global warming potential. The regulations apply to all new automobile platforms beginning in 2013 and to all new automobiles by 2017. Therefore, automobile manufacturers in developed countries have transitioned their technical standards to 1234YF, which has a low global warming potential. Both Arkema and Honeywell wish to supply the industry with 1234YF, and both have invested substantial resources in the production of 1234YF. Honeywell established a global patent portfolio, which is challenged by Arkema for novelty and inventive step in many different jurisdictions. 
The dispute resulting from this competition was fought between Honeywell and Arkema, predominantly in Europe and the US, but also other jurisdictions played an important role. Next slide, please. On this slide, uh, you can see a table with 10 patents granted on the use of HFO 1234YF that have been granted in the United States, Japan, and uh, by the European Patent Office. These 10 patents appear to be most relevant to the use of pure 1234YF as the refrigerant in auto air conditioning. Divisional patent applications are not considered here, even though in reality they also play an important role. Honeywell also filed patent applications on other jurisdictions like India and China, but today I'm not going to focus on these. All the patents you see here on this list uh, filed in the US were challenged uh, sooner or later by Arkema and the battle is still ongoing nowadays. All the European patents filed here were challenged too and all of them were revoked one after the other, the last one in 2020. In my presentation, I'm going to focus on the two Japanese patents to the right. Next slide, please. please. <clears throat> In the long history of this battle, the two companies have used several tools to challenge each other, as well as other competitors. As already mentioned, numerous patent disputes were filed. It started all in 2009 when Honeywell and Arkema in Germany, when, when Honeywell sued Arkema in Germany for infringement of a European patent. During the years that followed, both players made claims and counterclaims against each other's patents in the US and Europe. Every patent listed on the previous slide was sooner or later challenged by either Arkema or another company. In addition to all the patent disputes, several antitrust investigations have been filed. For example, Arkema accused Honeywell of hindered competition on the market of HFO 1234YF. By refusing to grant licenses, it said the use player is harming consumers, automobile manufacturers, and the environment by monopolizing a market they actually cannot fully supply themselves. There have been also some other challenges made by other competitors. For example, there has been a safety challenge made um, under the leadership of Daimler in Germany. And also quite recently, uh, Honeywell is still together with the customs confiscating shipments from Chinese companies of uh, one, two, three, four YF deliveries into Europe. Uh, there was a case in the Czech Republic in 2018 and one in Poland in 2019, where uh, shipments were confiscated and that later patent infringement lawsuits were filed. Next slide, please. So now let's look a little bit more in detail of what happened in Japan to these two patents that were filed by Honeywell. The first patent was filed in 2005. Um, the patent coverage was a heat transfer composition comprising a component described in a chemical formula in the, in the patent along with a polyol ester or polyalkaline glycol lubricant. During the prosecution already, a third party or several third parties investigated the dossier. This is already a sign that there might be some adversarial proceeding coming up. Finally, the patent was granted in March 2011. Within a very short period of time, three separate nullity actions, these are trials for invalidation in Japan, were filed by three different parties. One was of course filed by Arkema. The other two were filed by two Japanese companies, one by Daikin Industries and the other one by AGC, which used to be known as Asahi Glass. The Tokyo District Court issued decisions on all three nullity actions in May, 2013 and claim one to eight, which were the relevant claims to cover the product were all invalidated. Honeywell appealed to the IP High Court on these decisions, um, but all decisions were upheld in 2014. Honeywell then tried to appeal to the Supreme Court in Japan, but the Supreme Court decided not to hear the case. The decision to invalidate patent was finalized 2015 in April, and since no further appeals are possible, the decision is herewith finalized. To the next slide, please. Something quite similar happened to the other patent of Honeywell filed in Japan. This one was filed in 2006. And the patent covered use 
as a refrigerant of a constituent containing tetrafluoropropane, which is HF1234, in air conditioner of an automobile. Here again, um, there was a lot of inspection during the, the prosecution of the case. Uh, the case was granted in 2010, and soon afterwards, again, three nullity actions were filed. One nullity action was filed by Daikin Industry and later joined by Arkema. One by Arkema, later joined by Daikin Industry. So these two companies, French and Japanese, started to act together against Honeywell. The third nullity action was filed by Asahi Glass, but later withdrawn because Asahi Glass made an agreement with Honeywell. So they dropped out. Nevertheless, the Tokyo District Court um, issued a decision in 2015 and invalidated the full patent. Honeywell again appealed to the IP High Court, but the decision was upheld in 2017. Then Honeywell tried to appeal to the Supreme Court, but the case again was not heard. So the decision was finalized in 2018. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the decision in a little bit more detail. For both patents, the issue was whether the inventive step requirement was fulfilled or not. There were two problems, whether the invention can claim inventiveness or not. Number one, 1234YF was already described in a prior art among about a dozen other compounds. And problem number two, the prior art start stated 1234YF is actually a good refrigerant. Honeywell, however, had argued, yes, it is known as a refrigerant, but not for air conditioners for automobiles which are different from air conditioners in general. The judges, however, decided in both cases that air conditioning in automobiles is not so different and therefore the invention lacks inventiveness. Also, worth to mention is that despite a potentially social impact related topic, Supreme Court decided not to hear either case. This is because the Supreme Court in Japan cares about legal interpretation of the law, but only rarely social impact related cases, which include environmental related topics. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons learned from that? First of all, um, both parties can claim the position of the environmental friendly party. Honeywell for providing a product helping in the conservation of the environment and Arkema for stopping Honeywell from monopolizing a market relevant to the conversation, conservation of the environment and preventing unreasonable profit under the catchword of global environment. Number two, the Japanese patent system is neutral because it does not care whether the patentee is a good guy or a bad guy or whether the invention was made on a good will or not. Number three, the Japanese patent system simply asks whether the invention has novelty and inventive steps and whether it fulfills other requirements to get a patent in Japan. And number four, with the current examination standards, social impact or environmental impact is not considered when the JPU decides whether a patent is valid or not. And this is not a topic the Supreme Court deems important enough to hear. Now, next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Um, we're coming to the end of my presentation and I would like to finish here. I don't want to um, let you go with the feeling that Japan does not care about green technology. That is not the case at all. So the JPO periodically publishes studies on different technology sectors. And in 2016, they did a really small study on uh, green technology patented worldwide and in Japan. So on this graph, the columns that are blue, that's for publications by nationality so of people in Japan. Um, and you can see that uh, by far, companies originating in Japan have filed the most patent applications in the period between 2006 and 2014. 2013-14, uh, Chinese applicants kind of caught up. And I think we can imagine that they may have taken over Japan right now. So I don't have any data to prove or disprove that. But still in total over the last 10, 15 years, I think it's fair to say that Japanese companies have filed most applications for green related technologies. So Japan, Japan can be a good jurisdiction to search protection for green related technology. And you should not feel discouraged to file here a patent 
or other protection. Okay, um, next slide. That was everything from my side. I'm sorry, I think we got a little bit of overtime. But if you have any questions on IP protection in Japan or in China, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you very much, Luca, for presenting this very interesting case and the clear, the clear statements and encouragement given yeah, to do businesses in Japan and keep uh, innovation global. And also for Luca presenting the services of the EU Japan Help Desk. So now in view to time constraints, I'm just moving forward into the roundtable discussion and I'm asking the more or less to or the, the participants the, um, of the panel discussion today to, uh, to be ready to answer to some specific questions. So what we try to do is of course then we had a look at the, um, at the chat. So we saw there were a few questions coming in. Uh, first the questions were uh, addressing um, the case of uh, Christian. So just just an, an entry point, because I was referring at the beginning and in my introduction to an EC study, which is currently under the uh, preparation. The study is in layouting phase, so it means we expect the study to be published in the, in the coming weeks. And of course, we will inform about the publication uh, via the, the, our common channels like um, the, news, the newsletters from the help desks. So then, Christian, please um, be prepared. There were two questions which you may answer very briefly. One of them was um, uh, asking, did the political situation in Myanmar have had any impact on the Orkan success story um, in, in, in China? And maybe together also, uh, there was a question about the, um, the investment return time for a, a potential customer buying the product. Could you please address the two questions? Okay. Um, the first question, political situation, <clears throat> to be honest, I don't know. Um, this big project was in the year 2018. Um, so it's basically already up and running. Um, obviously, back then, it was the political situation of the opening of the country towards Western uh, partners, Western technology. Um, however, to be honest, right now, I don't know what's the situation. Um, well, period. I could only speculate on, on, on the political situation or on the impact of the political situation, which, which I don't know right now. Sorry. Um, second question. Um, sorry, Jörg. <laughs> could you repeat second question, please? The question was about what is the investment return time oh, yeah. for a customer okay, yeah. buying the product? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Obviously, uh, it depends, as usual, in terms of uh, technology. Um, for example, one of the main driver is um, the temperature of the exhaust gas. If the temperature or the exhaust water, whatever you have as medium, um, is below 100 degrees, obviously, it's, it's not so efficient. You can still use it, uh, but then return time is higher. Um, if the temperature is higher, return time goes down, and it can go down to as low as, for example, one and a half years. So it's really a return time is depending on the individual situation, but it can be really uh, in good situation. It can be below two years. And so obviously um, every investor will see it as a great investment with such a low uh, return, uh, time on return, return of investment. Thank you, Christian. Maybe another Trying question. To be brief. <laughs> um, yeah, another question. I mean, you mentioned in your presentation that it is very important to find the right local partner for internationalization strategies. So tell us how Orkan managed to do the first steps in teaming up with uh, strategic business partners from China. Um, yes. Um... Obviously, I mentioned uh, for a small startup, it's it's very difficult uh, to approach China to make the decision, should we go in there or not? Uh, then they made the decision uh, to, to team up with a partner. Obviously, then the question is how to find them. Um, what they did and, and what really worked well, they took part in official delegation trips of Bavarian or German ministries. Most of the countries that have official delegation um, visits from one country to another um, often uh, led by the Minister of Economic 
public affairs or whatever, they took part in these missions. And this really worked as a door opener. Um, they uh, got in contact with many people. And because these were these official ministry delegation, it was sort of the first quality check. Um, they, they met sort of trustful partners there. And then obviously this was the door opener and then came the, the subsequent steps of basically um, talk about the technology, having the NDA, which is always important, um, visits and, and counter visits, and then basically build up the trust, which is necessary to go in there. Uh, but I would say taking part in these uh, official delegation visits was very, very helpful for Orkan. And this would be a great advice, um, I think for other listeners in a similar situation. Thank you, Christian. Now we move to Daniel. We move to Daniel. Daniel, I mean, uh, my first question would be that uh, in the first two presentations we, we had today, we, we learned that an integrated local innovation ecosystem with players such as research organizations, universities, TTOs, or business advisors will establish favorable conditions to bring clean tech clean tech uh, results from the lab phase to the business. So am I right that this also applies to your case uh, in, in, in Porto? It was a very yes, important yes. factor. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, if you remember from my presentation that the technology born at the University of Porto and, and the startup was founded and they are still connected. And that is very important. So after these uh, 18 years, uh, they have master and, and PhD students together, uh, so there is it is exchange of know-how. It's critical because the SMEs have limited resources for R&D departments, and they have no no uh, financial resources to to have all this knowledge to solve the problem of adjust the customer. So there is a, a synergy between the university uh, and the company. But uh, I should add something because all of you are aware from the triple helix. And sometimes there is a missing partner here. In this case, they are partner, but, but uh, sometimes we have uh, a, a company, we have the university, but it misses the business inside a company that will further develop and commercialize the technology and not a company that is a, a final user. So I think that the ecosystems are completely very completely essential in this process also to bring the, the venture capital inside the ends and the final word is share your success. Don't try to do the, the all the way alone and, and be part of a group and, and share your knowledge and success. Okay, thank you. Uh, a second question. I mean, you, you addressed actually the challenge of um, IP identification and IP management within collaborative research and innovation projects. We see that in many cases, for example, from research and innovation actions or innovation actions funded in Horizon 2020. And we're going to see that even more in the future in Horizon Europe. So this, the, what we see here is the main challenge is that usually such collaborations result in joint ownership situations as you presented in, in, in your case. So. Um, and you obviously managed to challenge this um, successfully. So um, referring to your specific case or in your overall capacity as a European IP help desk ambassador. So what are good practices to protect, to share and to exploit IP created in such collaborative environments? Okay, yeah, very simple, uh, build trust. Uh, <laughs> okay, it is not easy in the, in the, real, in the real world. Uh, my piece of advice to you is to have a crystal clear communication with our partners from the, the very beginning. Be aware that for some of them, they are not used and have a kind of afraid of IP issues. So uh, we have a, a dual role of educate them and guide them uh, along the process, okay? There is also um, a common mistake and confusion between the ownership and access rights, even in the cost context of the European projects. So many times companies think that they own, they, they must own the IP, but they just want to have access for a certain uh, application or under certain terms. And, and many times the example of the orange is, is very, very useful. So many times, uh, you want the juice, the others want the peel, and both parties are, are, are happy with that. And if once if we split the orange, maybe anyone could do nothing with, with that. 
So, and summing up and, and connecting also with the previous question is, is to, to be aware that in, in some of these projects, they also they miss a lot uh, a company that can exploit, in fact, the technology. In the, in the case of the Predator, uh, we have a, a, a very powerful user because they have a, a very big facility. So the, the, the app scaling and the demonstration is done, but then we should be connected and have a, a common strategy to go to the market and to find a, another partner that help us at bring a product or a service based on the predator technology. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Then welcome. Then, as this is a really uh, a quick, a very quick uh, round of um, of discussion, so we move then to to Benoit. Um, Benoit, so from your experience in the Southeast Asia IPSME help desk, so what are the most relevant considerations when, when planning an IP strategy for entering into the Southeast Asia market? Okay, thank you, uh, Jor, for uh, sharing the, this question, this concern. In fact, it's a very uh, frequent question that we hear uh, for webinars and for so when we are contacted by the well, through the helpline of the help desk. So uh, IP in terms of property is uh, key to competitiveness and uh, for the business uh, in the global economy. It's, uh, would say it's a for securing a return on investment in innovation, creativity, reputation. And it's uh, like one of the most uh, relevant part for uh, SME and uh, specifically uh, EU SME when it's uh, designing to uh, go uh, abroad. Uh, it's uh, also like a uh, very important source of cash flow and uh, revenues uh, for an SME because uh, they will be able to uh, set some uh, uh, licensing deals or even uh, IP sales or other kind of agreements involving uh, intellectual property. Um, I would say that based on uh, our webinars guide that all available on our uh, websites of uh, the help desk, uh, I would share some um, tips. Uh, maybe on how to use and implement an efficient uh, IP strategy in uh, Southeast Asia. First would be uh, identify your IP assets and know which one you want to protect or which is not uh, like relevant to protect. Prioritize the protection uh, accordingly to your uh, specific strategy. The third uh, tip, for example, would be uh, assess the strengths and also the vulnerability of your business and set it according to the countries of interest you have in mind, uh, still discussing about uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, fourth one would be um, register your core uh, intellectual property rights as soon as possible, just don't waste, because uh, as you may uh, probably know or not, in Southeast Asia it's the first to file system uh, in most of the countries of the region. Um, another tip would be uh, uh, thinking about uh, online protection and online protection um, systems. Uh, it's very efficient. Uh, you can uh, detect uh, some counterfeiting canals and sources. Um, I would also add uh, maybe preparing your contracts, uh, like written contracts, uh, trying to set some uh, very specific uh, non disclosure agreements in uh, English, but also in the local language, because in Southeast Asia, we have a very uh, different uh, languages and so it's always good to have like a local translation and uh, finally uh, always trying to get the help and contact support of a uh, IP intellectual property local expert and this person uh, will be able to further explain you the specific policy the specific practice tools and help you to guide and also connect uh, with uh, the um, national IP office uh, thank you, Benoit. Maybe just a very last question and a brief answer to that. I mean, uh, we know that sometimes European SMEs try to, to work on, when, when it comes to register IP, try to work on the registration themselves. Would, what would you recommend them? Do they need to hire a lawyer or would you also give them assistance to find the most appropriate one? Well, in, in fact, uh, most, uh, in most of the countries of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, local registration is necessary to protect your IP uh, because I told it was the first to file system um, and there are specific rules. 
it's not like a global territory. You have to apply on each each country from each country, for, for example, for trademarks and patents. Um, so I would say that yes, uh, generally it would be better to uh, contact a IP expert, mainly because uh, before some uh, local uh, IP offices, the representation is mandatory. Uh, well, you have to do you you do have uh, to. Uh, uh, appoint a local representative but the second step would be that before some uh, IP offices you there's only the local language which is accepted so if you are a, a US mean you will have to go through translation and uh, this can also be uh, brought to you by the help of the IP local expert but I would point out that some uh, of the offices of IP offices in Southeast Asia are now uh, more familiar with English, and for example, you see uh, Brunei, Cambodia, the Philippines, Singapore, and uh, you can also uh, find applications in English. And this is the same for the website, it's slowly evolving, and now you can also uh, see a lot of information available on the websites, it's uh, also in English. Okay, thank you. Then, then we move to the next uh, panelist uh, representing uh, the Latin American Help Desk. So Cesar, I mean, um, what are the most common difficulties or, or barriers that uh, European companies face um, when they reach out for Latin America or get in contact with the, Europe, uh, with the Latin American help desk? Mm, that's a tough question. Yeah, I may have to take a look on the speaker notes if I may, but no, it's, it's not that tough because um, <laughs> Many companies come to us and addressing the very same kind of question. They're trying to take the leap and they don't know how to do that. And the very first barrier or problem they encounter is that they cannot do that themselves. And Latin America has a, from a regulation and business point of view, a very different ecosystem. And starting from the beginning, uh, online access is not as normal as it is in Europe. You cannot just simply go to the website of the intellectual property office and file the present the application if you have no local domicile there so that will be the first barrier you need to have you need to have a local domicile but would make any sense to be able to send the present this application if you don't really know the specificities of the local regulation no sense as really good well appointed uh, Eugene Sweeney in the chat, you need to have strong rights to do this. And if you just haven't, if you're just doing that yourself, maybe you're not identifying the weaknesses of your right. And at an ultimate stage, you would be rejected and you would have lost time and money. So having your own, uh, doing that on your own is not that easy. You need to go, if you rely on local experts even in, in some countries, you don't have even online resources. You need to go that physically. So this is a, one of the main concerns. The second one is that you don't, are not using your own language as the Madrid system, for instance, as we mentioned that during our case study presentation, is not so well spread. You need to go country by country, which means translations, a lot of the documentation, and you need to rely on local experts again. So it is not as accessible as they wish. And they have some specificities. And for instance, there is no undesign protection for non-registered design, which is kind of a shock for those companies of the fashion industries, which are relying on this kind of, of protection form that in Europe protect, provides from automatic protection. Whereas in Latin America, you're absolutely naked. Either you register or you can be absolutely exposed to legal copies. And finally, I would say that the last uh, one is counterfeiting. It is not as high as one can imagine. It is not so drastic, but it is a concern. And if you don't have any IP rights registered and you're starting with a low profile saying, I'm going to go there, see if it works, and then I'm going to register, it may be simply too late. Once you're in, people are going to see if your product is really worthy and they're going to copy immediately. So if they don't protect that, they're screwed. Thank you very much, Cesar. I mean, there's just not enough time for, for more questions. There's only one, and which one I would like to address to Nicole, because that's 
uh, one uh, we received in the in the chat um and it is about um yeah a problem i think which refers to uh, all the international cases that smes usually do not have the experiences or the financial means to deal with infringers and the question here would be are how could uh, smes um adopt strategies and best practices to monitor and to deal with potential infringers taking into account yeah the challenges smes usually face is there any good uh, good tip good recommendation how smes could um, could um, manage this challenge maybe nicole or benoit could you address this question Uh, yes, for Japan, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer. So the the JPO has a specific desk for SMEs too that, that, that brings some support. Might not be so easy because of the language to directly communicate with them, but if there is a Japanese language specialist in the team, then it might be an option to reach out to them and see whether there is some support that is possible to get there for free. And another option, if there are some funds around uh, with working together with the local council and making a good deal that the local council is keeping an eye out for competitors and infringers is another option, but that will cost them a little bit. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. It did because it really was one one of the one of the questions in the in the chat. And I think what you the, the case you presented for Japan is also something we could uh, definitely also transfer to to other international uh, territories. So I mean, I, I'm really sorry. I think we we could keep on talking for hours, but uh, I have to um, to to move and to pass the word over. To Simon for for the for the conclusion. So from my side, so very very much. Thank you very much for all your great presentations, your reflection points, and the takeaway messages in this short round of discussion. If there are any further questions from the audience, please get in contact with our colleagues from the from the help desk. So please make sure. I mean, this is directed to our participants and the audience today. Please make sure that you benefit from the large experience and the hands-on services to start or to grow your business. By this, I would like to hand over to Simon and uh, a big thank you to the panelists, to the experts for take that you took some time and you brought out this very interesting discussion. So please, Simon. Thank you, York, um, and thank you for co-moderating today's event. And I would also add uh, many thanks to all our presenters for their insightful contributions and, and for giving us the benefit of their, their knowledge and experience. I think it's fantastic to know that these help desk resources are available uh, to guide businesses from an IP perspective to make better informed decisions decisions which can be critical to enable them to be internationally competitive uh, and decisions which can be so important to ch achieving sustainability and long-term benefit from from innovations i think nowhere is this more relevant than for the transformation to a greener more digital and resilient industry and the help desks provide tools to support our industrial ecosystems in this transformation and reinforce their global competitiveness. If I may too just add uh, or pick out a few of the key takeaway points. We, we heard from the Orkin case study uh, which shows the importance of registration of IPR to gain credibility uh, from uh, Mark Peters and Benoit. Uh, we heard about the crucial need for a sound IP strategy and what that can, tell, uh, that can entail. Uh, we also heard from Daniel an example of why businesses need to use different types of intellectual property rights. And from Simo uh, and Caesar, one of the first things we heard to do as a startup is register a trademark and that to license you need intellectual property rights. And we've also heard that the help desks are set up to focus and advise on strategies and practices. Uh, SMEs with all their financial and resource constraints can adopt in destination markets where rules and languages are different. In, back in 2019, the President of the European Commission said of the EU, we are not 
naive free traders. And the help desks give access to guidance, knowledge, and local experience on IP issues, which can help our businesses avoid the pitfalls of IP naivety. So having said that, I would like to, to close uh, this event by encouraging all business support organizations in attendance to not hesitate and reach out to the help desks for free support and for SMEs to reach out for any questions they might have regarding the management of their IP in Europe or third markets. Um, so it just remains for me to, to thank you all for attending. Thank you.